Hi, I'm Mike McGinnis. I'm a senior research fellow here at the Ostrom Workshop at Indiana University in Bloomington. Uh, this is a follow-up video to the first video entitled, um, uh, What is Polycentric Governance? A Quick Answer. Well, the word quick in the subtitle might have been a little misleading because it took me about 15 minutes to go through the basic ideas that lie behind the concept uh, of polycentric governance. And it may take me about that long in this video uh, to give you a better sense of um, why such a such this one concept uh, is powerful enough to serve as the basic foundation for the entire academic and policy relevant apparatus of the Bloomington School of Political Economy or Institutional Analysis. I will do so by going through a couple examples of the way in which researchers and practitioners trained in this Bloomington School use the concept of polycentric governance to help them understand and to some extent reform policy outcomes in quite distinct areas of public policy. In particular, I will discuss the hidden role polycentric governance played in Eleanor Ostrom's Nobel Prize winning research on commons management, its origin story from back in 1961, and its earliest application to urban policing in the United States, its deep connection to the U.S. Constitution, and its growing influence on contemporary political discourse, especially regarding the future of the European Union and policy responses to global climate change. I will highlight a few of the key books for each example, and a complete reference list should be available on the Ostrom Workshop website uh, near where this video is located. To recap that first video, I'll briefly review my preferred definition of governance and a short list of the generic tasks that any effective system of governance must accomplish. Governance encompasses all of the processes which determine the range of acceptable individual or collective choices available to members of the associated group or community. In addition, governance decisions must be discussed, made, implemented, enforced, and reevaluated by or for members of that relevant community, group or community. It may sound like a lot, and it is, but in fact, all of this is way too important for citizens of a democratic society to be content to delegate all of this to public officials acting alone. In the US, we have a very complex governmental apparatus comprised of a multitude of public agencies, each of which is a distinct center of limited authority whose leaders focus attention on some limited part of overall policy problems. But in addition, the rest of society gets very involved in matters of governance. Private, professional, nonprofit, and community-based organizations all play critical roles. Private corporations, professional associations, voluntary organizations influence policy outcomes through campaign donations, lobbying, advising regulators, delivering public services, and reform campaigns. In short, all kinds of governance activities routinely involve individual and organizational participants beyond the public agencies with legal jurisdiction over such matters. And in democratic societies, governance should not be seen as something distinct, something that the government does to us. Instead, it should directly involve a great many of us as active participants. If you want to understand how polycentric governance operates in the US or anywhere else for that matter, you need to understand who has been participating in different ways and why and how they chose to interview in those matters of public concern in those particular ways. Since governance requires a lot of tasks to be accomplished, each of which requires actions of different types of decision centers, both public and non-public, the process of governance as a whole involves many different decision makers at decision centers acting in interdependent ways. Since poly means many, the meaning of polycentric governance follows, emerge, follows naturally. A system in which many diverse centers of partial authority collectively cover, cover the full range of governance costs. Plus, polycentric governance is found not just in advanced industrial societies, far from it. To convince you, consider a very influential book written by Eleanor Ostrom called Governing the Commons. In that book, Lynn, as we always knew her here at IU, 
summarized the finding of research teams that spent years studying and comparing cases of communities around the world dependent on fishing, farming, forestry management, herding, hunting, or other commonly shared pools of natural resources. Lynn summarized her findings in a list of eight design principles, which she found, albeit under very different specific forms, in all of those communities most successful at maintaining long-term access to the commons upon which their livelihoods depended. These principles summarize the ways in which members of those communities crafted, monitored and enforced on themselves a set of rules that limited how and when they could appropriate resources from their common pools and set requirements for users to contribute to the joint maintenance of the irrigation system or other needed infrastructures. Now Lynn explicitly mentioned governance only with respect to the last two principles marked in IU red on this slide which required that all of these locally based arrangements needed to be nested within a supportive system of polycentric governance that ensured the user group's right to manage those resources in ways that they deemed appropriate. The polycentric governance plays a much bigger role in the Bloomington School approach than Lynn was able to articulate in just the one book governing the commons. As many of you already know, Lynn shared the 2009 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences quote, for her analysis of economic governance, especially the commons, uh, as the Nobel Committee summarized her prize-worthy contributions to scholarly knowledge. However, I was disappointed that the Nobel Committee never even mentioned polycentricity or polycentric governance in their otherwise excellent overview of her research program. The closest they came was to acknowledge, quote, that she had demonstrated that appropriation, provision, monitoring, enforcement, conflict resolution and governance activities can all be organized in multiple layers of nested enterprise. Lynn set this record straight by entitling her Nobel Memorial Lecture, Beyond Markets and States, Polycentric Governance of Complex Economic Systems. Frankly, the word systems in the title uh, are designated to be economic, primarily because her prize was for research in economic sciences and Lynn was gracious in all things. In her lecture, Lynn made it eminently clear that for her, a polycentric mode of governance was an option that should be considered as potentially relevant for all kinds of policy problems, although each type of policy would require differently shaped governance systems tuned to fit its own unique form of complexity. In short, Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize for demonstrating that local communities around the world have for centuries demonstrated their ability to accomplish all of the steps of polycentric governance for themselves. Now, several researchers working in the Bloomington School or related research traditions have begun to use this analytical tool to better understand how these many decision processes are related to each other and to compare the performance of different kinds of governance arrangements on a variety of evaluative criteria. In another of these videos, I will dig more deeply into the question of which of the many combinations of structural configurations, institutional options, outcome distributions, feedbacks, and evalu evaluative processes are best suited to the smooth operation of a system of polycentric governance in the sense of generating policy outcomes that citizens deem to be desirable and appropriate. That remains very much a work in progress. And anyways, I'm getting far too ahead of my story here. So let's return to the beginning to consider when this powerful governance concept first appeared in print. In 1961, over 10 years before the Ostrom workshop was first established and several years before Vincent and Eleanor Ostrom actually moved to Indiana University, Vincent Ostrom, Charles Thibault and Robert Warren introduced the concept of a polycentric political system quote, in an article in the American Political Science Review. Although revered by workshoppers as the initial core statement of the Bloomington School's principles, OTW 1961, as we tend to call it, uh, frankly did not have much an effect on the policy literature of that day. I'll discuss reasons for this oversight in, in, in another video, but for now it suffices to note that the, that the authors use the term, quote, multi-nested, excuse me, multi-nucleated communities, unquote, in a footnote 
to describe the typical physical arrangement of metropolitan areas in the US. Although this uncomfortable phrase has been thoroughly ignored in the subsequent literature, I have chosen to resurrect it here today in order to highlight the inherently nested structure of polycentric governance. It is by definition a dynamic system through which relationships among collective entities, each with its own internal governance system and agents acting on its behalf, are in turn governed through a series of processes of mutual adjustment among their agents. The classic definition of a polycentric system of governance comes from um, that origin article, OTW 1961. Quote, the traditional pattern of government in a metropolitan area with its multiplicity of pure political jurisdictions may more appropriately be conceived as a polycentric political system. Polycentric connotes many centers of decision-making which are formally independent of each other. Whether they actually function independently or instead constitute an interdependent system of relations is an empirical question in particular cases. The foundational theoretical claim made by OTW was that in multinucleated communities, a polycentric system of governance might have considerable advantages over the more centralized forms of consolidated regional governance that were then, and often now as well, widely advocated as the proper direction for progressive reform. Their argument here was a subtle one. Briefly, since any citizens in communities share interests in realizing a wide array of public goods and services, which can't all be efficiently produced or maintained at the same level of aggregation. And since citizens with divergent tastes on which types of services were most important or most desirable, tend to separate themselves into more homogeneous neighborhoods or other groupings, it makes a lot of sense to make sure that individual citizens, neighborhoods, and dispersed communities would all enjoy continued access to multiple options for each of them to arrange for the procuring of different kinds of desired public services to be produced by organizations operating at different scales of aggregation. Full consolidation of all public services under the authority of a single region-wide public authority might seem more economically efficient to earnest reformers, but that would limit the effective range of citizen choice for procuring the highest quality local public goods and services they were seeking. When the Ostrom's first was first Ostrom workshop was first established in 1973, Lynn had begun leading a series of research projects evaluating the delivery of police services in consolidated metropolitan areas compared to their more natural multinucleated arrangement. In particular, they looked at the city of Indianapolis, uh, just an hour's drive north of Bloomington where uh, most of the neighborhoods in the Indianapolis area and then the Monroe County area had been consolidated into the city of Indianapolis, but a few were left outside and, and this provided them an opportunity to compare some of these small communities with neighborhoods in Indianapolis that had very similar sorts of characteristics. After considerable research into this, into this question of various different kinds of police services, the researchers concluded that levels of public satisfaction with the quality of police services were much higher in areas where the police forces were organized and operated at the community level compared to regionally consolidated forces. Uh, this research provided the initial round of empirical evidence that polycentric governance could indeed have positive benefits in some areas of public policy, and they went on to um, uh, basically replicate these kinds of findings uh, in other metropolitan areas in the United States. Two, pu two books published in 1999 provide overviews of the theoretical argument and empirical studies that emerged from this first effort to test the ideas put forward by Ostrom, Thiebaud, and Warren in 1961. And in her Nobel Memorial Lecture, Lynn did note how closely this early research on police services connected to her later, much more widely known research on commons management. Physically speaking, metropolitan areas do indeed resemble multinucleated communities in the sense that one or a few central cities are surrounded by clusters of suburbs, each of which has its own coterie of local officials and public buildings. 
But this notion of fitting governing institutions to the arrangements found in multinucleated communities is now more generally relevant, frankly, given the substantial mixing of diverse ethnic, religious, and cultural communities throughout the world today. In a 2014 book, Paul Dragos Alicia argued that polycentric governance is uniquely suited to support democratic governance in multicultural societies. This suggests that Ostrom, Thiebaud, and Warren may not have fully realized just how broadly important the concept of polycentric governance could turn out to be for the world as a whole. For an example of its broader relevance, let's consider the concept of polycentric governance and its roles in current debates over global climate change. It's widely known that ongoing processes of climate change will have dramatically different consequences for communities in different environmental settings. So there's no way any single global treaty, no matter how well intentioned or effectively enforced, could possibly determine which policy outcomes would be most appropriate for each of these unique environmental situations. Over the last few years of her life, Lynn wrote a few papers and gave several speeches in which she argued that the world needs to employ a polycentric package of policy responses to the myriad causes and effects of climate change. And she emphasized that actions would need to be taken by individual consumers, households, neighborhood organizations, regulators, and other local, state, and national level officials, economic corporations, standard setting bodies, humanitarian aid agencies, and other nonprofit organizations, and yes, by international organizations. By convincingly explaining why such a multi pronged and multi level response was both absolutely necessary and already happening. Lynn helped change the terms of discourse on climate policy. Next, another example is the European Union, which is a unique multi-generational experiment in building a multi-level mode of democratic governance on a continental scale, encompassing a diverse array of national and regional cultures. Researchers applying the concept of polycentric governance to the European Union have focused their attention on the ever-changing interactions among formal public agencies dealing with regional, national, and continental implications of any particular policy sector. Contributors to this particular volume also specifically examine the extent to which the EU project in building polycentric governance has or has not been able to address longstanding concerns related to equity and social justice. Clearly, the nature of EU governance is very much a work in progress. So is polycentric governance in the United States. Years ago, Vincent Ostrom used the US Constitution as the stellar example of polycentric governance, serving as the basic principle in constitutional design. The political theory of compound republic and in other works, Vincent recognized that the basic idea of polycentric governance was present in the many checks and balances built into the US political system. The founders who wrote and began to implement the US Constitution purposefully divide, divided and distributed power and authority over different aspects of policy among the different branches of government and the ambiguous overlaps in the authority assigned to public officials at the national, state, and local levels they left unresolved have generated many positive changes throughout the subsequent development of American politics. More recently, three scholars associated with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University have argued that Vincent's works deserve to stand alongside classic statements of the foundational ideals of liberal democracy or classical liberalism as a desired mode of governance. I'd like to highlight two books written 20 years apart that provide very different takes on the critical question of the ability of public entrepreneurs, a category of political actors that includes public officials, community organizers, leaders of social movements or reformers, and social workers who help potential benef beneficiaries navigate the often substantial administrative barriers preventing them from taking full advantage of public welfare programs. Public entrepreneurs of these types played critical roles in the PhD dissertations written by both Vincent and Eleanor Ostrom in the 1950s and 1960s respectively. But since then, this topic has rarely been examined in detail with a few notable exceptions. In 1997, Vincent Ostrom published a book which raised significant concerns 
about the dangers of public entrepreneurs deluding themselves by using words and ideologies in ways that distort the true nature of the problems they are actually confronting. Vincent was very concerned that Tocqueville may have been correct in his concern about the long-term viability of democracy. In 2019, Paul Dragos Iglesias updated the theoretical and empirical findings on the ability of public entrepreneurs to provide solid, solid civic-minded leadership to their communities and gave us some hope for arriving at more optimistic conclusions. Of course, this question very, remains very much an open one. Given our recent collective experiences with the global rise of authoritarian alternatives to democratic self-governance, but that's a whole other story. Now I could go on indefinitely mentioning topics covered in other videos or other books, line books written by scholars associated with the Bloomington School, but my time for this particular video has run out. To wrap up, polycentric governance has recently become a bit of a hot topic, especially among activists supporting Lynn's suggestion that we need to employ a polycentric package of diverse and multi-level policy responses to the causes and effects of global climate change. And a small but growing community of social scientists seeking to rigorously compare the consequences of alternative forms of governor, governance arrangements on a wide range of policy outcomes. But this flurry of activity now is just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, since this concept already has a long history of theoretical development and empirical research and it is likely to continue to inspire and inform many future elaborations and innovations. If my talk has piqued your interest in learning more, I encourage you to check out, check out my other videos and especially those my colleagues posted on the instructional resources page of the Ostrom Workshop website. As I noted earlier, a detailed list of references to these different examples of polycentric governance in action should also be available there. There's a lot of interesting information available on that website, and I hope you will enjoy your exploration of polycentric governance as it is understood within the Bloomington School of Political Economy or of Institutional Analysis. Thank you.